welcome again to the Lord's house, whether you're watching online or whether you're in the room. We are glad and, and count this a privilege to spend some time with you studying the word of God. Let's begin with a word of prayer. May the words of my mouth, the things I'm about to say, Lord, may they, may they honor you and be faithful to you. Not my ideas, but, but your truth. And may all the assembled hearts, all the thoughts of all in the room, also be focused not only on what is said, but how what is said applies in our life. Lord, bless both speaker and hearer. Send your Holy Spirit according to your promise into this room that we might be blessed by the time that we spend with you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, in just a moment, we're going to take a look at Psalm 139, which is, uh, I think, one of the most incredible psalms in all the Bible. And uh, we're going to deal with this question of conformity and uniqueness because I believe that both are required to be fully human, to be all that God intends us to be, to accomplish all that God intends for us to accomplish. Not just to his glory, but to his glory, to the benefit of our fellow man, but also to your own benefit and to the own enjoyment that you have and the contentment and the satisfaction that you have with life. Well, we're approaching the end of summer. In fact, uh, Pooh is going to come up here in a little bit again and tell you more about uh, summer session this afternoon, which is a program that's designed for junior high and high school students. And it's the last of the summer sessions because it's the last of summer. I hope that you've had an opportunity to get away and, and unwind and, and relax a bit this summer. Uh, I'm not uh, at the same pace I used to be. I'm partially retired, and I'm supporting Dion now instead of leading the ministry here. And it's a great thing for me, but I'm kind of adjusting to that. And uh, if Dion thought I was just going to sit around and wait for him to give me assignment, he was mistaken. You know. uh, when we have time off, we like to get away. And one of the places we like to go is Florida. And uh, I don't know if you've been there, but uh, we like to go to the Panhandle, to the uh, white sand beaches from Destin all the way to Pensacola and spend some time there. In fact, I just got back from there uh, last Thursday night. And uh, Carol and I are apt to enjoy that kind of opportunity. There's a picture here coming up soon. You see, I don't always look put together like I am now. <laughs> Get a little scruffy, sometimes don't shave for days. And uh, we just enjoy a different kind of pace, a different kind of experience. But while we were down there this past 10 days or so, uh, there was a tropical depression that was swirling around. This isn't exactly it, but it was kind of like that. And it was just swirling off the coast here. And they kept talking about flood warnings. You know, it's going to come in and 10 inches a foot of rain in some areas. And we know that it, it kind of moved uh, further west. And we know that Louisiana... Uh, suffered uh, a lot of flooding. Mississippi as well suffered a lot of flooding. And it, it just kind of kept circulating off the coast. And while it didn't come in only occasionally, it, it did come in a bit, but not always, uh, it did create a lot of heavy surf. In fact, if you walk out to the beach, which, which we do uh, occasionally, Carol likes to go out there and I'll go out with a sand wedge. <laughs> or with a book and, and read. Uh, she enjoys sitting there and walking up and down the beach looking for shells. And uh, you'll come across these warning signs as you approach the water. Uh, it's closed to public. Uh, these red signs, or it's a high hazard, strong currents. You're warned not to go into the water when you see a red flag. Yellow flag means there's some undertow. And uh, green flag means low hazard. And uh, uh, purple flag means dangerous mar marine life has been sighted, and you should be uh, aware of that, whether they be jellyfish or, or whatever they might be. And, and so these signs are important, and they're right there as you walk out to the beach, every place that you might cross the dunes and hit the beach. So while we were there, a number of days, the red flags were flying. And they were warning about the possibility of heavy surf and even worse, uh, rip tides. I don't know if you've been to the beach much, but a rip current is uh, caused because whatever comes in must go out. And when it comes in really hard, it goes out really hard. And it will form these little funnels up and down the coast. Uh, and if you get caught in one of these rip currents, it will tell you that you cannot fight it. If you try to fight it, you will drown. It's just stronger than any person could swim. Even Michael Phelps could not swim in the rip current. Uh, and so what they encourage you to do is swim with it for a time until you get to a certain place, probably deeper water, and then break loose and break free and then swim along the coast until you can come back into shore. Now, unfortunately, while we were there, 
Uh, in fact, on the very beach where we were at, not at the same time, but there was a 61-year-old man who had been coming to Navarre for 30 years uh, who was caught in one of these riptides and drowned. It's kind of a crazy thing because the surf comes in really hard and slaps you this way while the uh, undertow pulls you this way so it's being hit high-low like a football player and it just knocks you off your feet. Uh, he was not a swimmer. He was fishing, but he was wade fishing and didn't realize the danger until he was swept out into the rip current and, and drowned. Now, the reason that I've chosen this as an introduction is because I, I think it's a good metaphor for what I'm talking about today. There are times in which you must conform. There are times in which the current is so strong, you'd be foolish to fight it. There are things about society, things about living together that require that we conform. But if you continue to conform, you will lose your personal identity altogether and you will not be what God intended. So while we must conform for a while, there is also a time in which you must break free and establish your own uniqueness or else you will drown and lose your sense of personal created identity. We're going to be looking at Psalm 139, verses 13 to 16, uh, as we study this issue of conformity and uniqueness. I said it's one of my favorite psalms because it's, it's that psalm, if you've, you've heard it but maybe don't know where it is, you should make a note, maybe read the whole psalm, because he talks about how God knows him so personally, so intimately. He says, you go before me and you come behind me. Not a thought forms on my mind that you don't know it. When I rise up or when I lay down, you are right there. He says, before I speak a word, you know what I'm going to say. It's just an intimate psalm of David who, who says, you know me so well. You know, you're my closest, most intimate companion. And he even goes on to say, and if I were to go to the ends of the earth, you would be there. And if I were to make the day around me as black as night, Night and day are the same to you. You're always there. Even when I go to the grave, I will find you there. There's no place that I could go that you won't be. And then he turns to these verses, 13 and 16. He says, Lord, you created my inmost being. You made me the way I am. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Ecclesiastes 11 also says that. You know where it says, cast your bread upon the water. It also says, as you do not know how the bones are formed in the womb of a mother, so you do not know the activity of God. God created us. God caused us to be. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are marvelous or wonderful. And I, I know that beyond my ability to express. I know it full well. My frame was not hidden from you. You know, when, when I was conceived, you were right there. You understood what was happening. You were involved in that when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together upon the face of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. You know, what does this say about life in the womb and how precious life is to God even at the earliest stage? Your eyes saw my unformed substance. And in your day, and, and all the days ordained for me, the length of my life. All of them were written in your book before even one of them came to pass. It doesn't say God causes my death, but God right now knows the length of my days. He knows when my last breath will be taken and he will be there for me as well. well let's take a look at this in light of our theme for today, the human race and how God has created us unique. He has created you. You know, we often think about the first article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe that God created heaven and earth as though creation is some past action. It's not a past action. God is still in the business of creating. David said, you created my inmost being. I'm not an automatic response to a biological function. Anybody who says, well, I know how I was created. You know, my mom and dad created me. You know, there's nothing special, nothing miraculous about it. It's just simply not the case. Whenever a man and a woman have sexual relations, do you know that a male releases some 40 million to 1.2 million sperm cells every occasion? Boggles the mind. I can't believe that's even possible. 40 to 1.2 million sperm cells. In fact, we have this picture that explains it really well. This is the first known picture of Michael Phelps 
He's out in front of some 50 million others, you know, headed for that egg. And only one of those 50 to 1.2 million sperm cells get to impregnate that female egg, and then not every occasion. In fact, some people can go for years and not experience conception. And so God is specifically, scientifically involved in your creation. Just think of all the possibilities. It boggles the mind. Each one of us have a different DNA. I don't, I don't care even if you're identical twins. They say that there are 300 million chemical markers in your DNA, and no two are alike. Can you imagine the complexity of that? And, and you don't have to just know the science. Uh, you can look at families. This is my family of origin. This is my dad. He was a World War II vet. I'm about two years old there, so I've been about 1954, I guess. My older brother, George. My oldest sister, Cynthia. Uh, my next oldest, second oldest in the family, Kathy. And then this must have been uh, my younger brother, James. And, and so there are five of us in this picture. There were going to be two more added. Uh, this would have been David, I guess. There are going to be two more added. And, and while you see some similarities in this picture, this one over here is a redhead. <laughs> We were towheads. Uh, she was a brunette. And, and if you don't believe that there are differences even in families, look at this picture 20 years later. In the 70s, these are my brothers. My mom got kidded a lot for, you know, who were the father of your children? Because none of us just looked alike. This guy is still kind of reddish hair. And uh, my uh, youngest brother, uh, James, looked like he had just walked off of a Native American Indian tribe. And uh, my oldest brother, George, was quite dapper. Uh, and, and so there we are. You know, it's just different. God created us different, scientifically different. But you can also see that no matter how much you're alike in your family. In fact, I, we conduct a lot of memorial services here, uh, more than we'd like to conduct. But it's always very precious. And it's always fascinating to me as I sit down with the families and we talk about stories of childhood that uh, if, if everybody in that family and five or six kids lost a dad or a mom, they all lost a different person because their relationship with that dad or mom are unique to them. Do you know that's true? You know, if you've had that, you know, you suffer your loss, but somebody else suffers their loss a little differently, even though it was your dad and their dad as well. It's just the nature of our uniqueness. But David didn't only say that God created me. He said, you created me fearfully and wonderful. You made me special. You made me awesome. David understood that about himself. I don't know how you feel about yourself. But David understood, despite his limitations, that God had not failed in his creation uh, of causing him to be the person that he was. Um, we know that social psychologists tell us that mature, well-adjusted people base their sense of their value, fearfully and wonderfully made, on the fulfillment of values that they themselves perceive as most important. I don't know what you perceive as most important, but on the basis of that, you will decide whether you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, what are your values in life? And if your life aligns with those values, not the values of others, but your own values, then you will say, you know, God has blessed me, and this is a great life. Not everybody looks at it that way. You know, we were shaped in our value system, certainly by our family of origin. Uh, in, in my family, honesty, hard work, the family itself, hospitality, those were all important values for my folks. In fact, my mom, to my embarrassment sometimes, would invite people into our house when our house was a wreck. I mean, there could be food on the table. There could be pots and pans stacked in the kitchen. She'd say, oh, come on over, you know? And people would walk in. She'd say, can you grab that? Can you grab this? Let's move these things there. There could be clothes hanging on the back of straight back chairs. Didn't matter to her, you know? She was all about hospitality. We lived close to a railroad track, and, and uh, there were people who were grabbing free rides on the railroads all the time. And, and when the railroad would stop, we were near uh, a, a place where there was a railroad yard uh, the, the bums, we call them, would come up and down the street begging for food. Mom always fed them. That was high on her value list. We were Christians. There were seven of us. Uh, I had to get two ready. Well, I didn't have to get them ready. Carol had to get them ready for worship because I was already at church. And, and that could almost bring a parent to tears to get one or two children ready for worship. 
she got seven ready, and they never missed church. Always got us to Sunday school. It was an important value for them. My dad was a union man, and uh, they were blue collar, and they were almost proud of their poverty. In, in fact, occasionally I would argue with them about, uh, about rich people because they'd be upset with rich people. And I said, don't you know, Mom, that if there weren't rich people in the world, Dad wouldn't have a job. You know, it's, it's okay for some people to do well. And so while I had some of those qualities in my life, and some of them I carry on and have passed on to their grandchildren, to my children, there are some uniquenesses too. You know, I was, I was swept along in conformity to some of their values, but I also realized that I'm different. You know, education was very important to me, and success became important to me. In fact, I had a benefactor who helped support me so that I could go to a college prep high school, the only one in my family that was uh, so blessed to do that. And, and uh, I remember that that bothered my mom a bit. She used to say, you're getting too smart for your own britches, as though getting too smart was a problem. You know? I remember one time uh, when I was a pastor uh, here, I'd been out in New York. I'd been invited to come out and to address some other pastors uh, in the uh, northeast uh, part of the United States. They'd paid my way. They'd given me an honorarium to come out and speak to them about Christian leadership. And I came back, and as was my custom, I called mom on the phone and asked how she was doing, and, and she asked what I was up to. And I said, well, I just got back from New York. I was out there speaking. And she goes, what were you speaking about? And I said, Christian leadership? And she said, what would you possibly have to say to them? You, know? <laughs> you just see my mom's understanding and her world was so different than mine. It was okay, but it kind of made me smile. You know, I've, I've loved to write. In fact, in high school, uh, a lot of my friends were involved in athletics, and I dabbled in athletics. I wasn't a great athlete, but I was a, an average to better than average athlete. But what I really loved was drama, being a reporter on the school paper, and, and being involved in debate. These weren't things that my friends cared much about. And so, you know, I had to own that for myself. I had to realize that I'm a little different than they are. Unfortunately, this is not the way that most people decide their value. A study of 5,000 young people, 16 to 20, discovered that the majority of them based their self-esteem or their fearfully and wonderfully made status not on their own personal values, but on the fulfillment of the values of their peers, what their friends think are important. And so if your friends think that a certain style of clothing is important, the power of conformity is so great and so hard to be an individual in those circumstances. Brands, labels, appearances. You know, are you an athlete or not an athlete? Are you acceptable or not acceptable on the basis of that? You know, the school that you attend, the subdivision that you live in, and the vehicles that you drive in. While I said this is a study of young people, I would say there's a lot of us older people who suffer from this issue as well when we let our culture and those around us determine our values. But David said, Lord, I will praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So there's not only the way you determine your values, there's not only the values that others set for you, I think there's the David equation, or there's the David attitude as well, and that's how does God see you. You know, David was not the perfect great leader David was guilty of adultery. And not only guilty of adultery, but trying to cover up his adultery, he was guilty of the murder of the woman's husband that he had had an illicit relationship with. Now, in our culture today, a Christian leader who had experienced that kind of uh, failure would certainly be dismissed and, and discredited and, and banished, you know, even from the church, it seems like, in my experience and observation. But God didn't give up on David. God thought David has learned from that mistake. There are some of the Psalms in the scripture that are so precious to us because David was uh, so humbled and so distraught over his own sinfulness. And he said, Lord, if you kept track of iniquity, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are honored. And so David understood uh, that he had made a mistake. He repented to the Lord and he was received back again. What we see as failure, God sees as basic training. And what might haunt you and you feel disqualifies you from service, 
God has forgiven and God has forgotten. God values the least of us. He doesn't just focus on the strength and the strong ones. He loves to use the ordinary person to do the extraordinary thing. So don't disqualify yourself for being significant in the kingdom of God because of some failure, because of some fault, because of some illness, because of some frailty, because of uh, advanced age or whatever it is that you might excuse yourself as being unimportant in the sight of God because God doesn't think like that. Even in the birth of Jesus, you see this. You know, certainly the angels announced the birth of Christ to the poorest of the poor, to the shepherds keeping watch over their flocks at night. But he also put a star in the heavens. And some of the most wealthy, most educated, and even foreign people were brought to the manger, were brought to the birthplace of Christ. God didn't discriminate. And you see this uh, also in the life of Jesus. You know, how he extended himself to all people to a Syrophoenician woman uh, who was considered a pagan and a dog by the disciples. He gave her time, he gave her attention, he granted her request. And to Nicodemus, who was a wealthy man, or, or to even Simon, who was a Pharisee, he extended time and he gave him himself. And, and to the poor and to the downtrodden as well, to the lepers, you know, to the rejected in society, there is no one that Jesus did not honor. And he was not defined by what the world expected of him. Now, I can't imagine if, if the Father had come to me in heaven and said, Son, I have a job for you to do, a mission. I want to send you to earth, and, and, and I want you to go down and, and save my people. I would say, can I choose to look like Brad Pitt, Farrell Williams, maybe uh, Ryan Gosling, you know? thinking what are the values of the earth because I want to be the most outstanding person that's ever lived on the face of the earth and I want to have great power and accomplish this mission. But that's not what happened, is it? No, that uh, powerful first song that we sang, Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God and how he died a miserable death. He was identified by his purpose and by his mission. In fact, the scripture says in Isaiah 53, he grew up before the Lord a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty, no majesty to attract us to him. So if you don't have no beauty and no majesty that others are attracted to you, so what? Neither did Jesus. Nothing in his appearance that would impress us. He was despised and rejected of men, are you? It wasn't too much for Jesus. He was glad to serve the Lord in that way. A man of sorrows and familiar with grief, like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised and most esteemed him not. Nothing disqualifies you from service in the Lord's kingdom. David was fearfully and wonderfully made. Now conformity has its place, but it's not in deciding your value. It's not in deciding your purpose. And conformity is not the best way for you to determine your potential. Conformity is important, I'll grant you that. I mean, we have traffic laws, and I wish more of you would conform to them. <laughs> I'm a little tired of, you know, watching out for you while you check your phones, you know, or having to honk at you while three cars drive through the light and you're still sitting there looking at your email. You know, traffic laws are important, and can you imagine a world where they are not? You know, like Jesse in Cambodia, I guess, you know. I've seen some of that action. That's not what we would want here. Or the Ten Commandments. You know, it's important that we conform. Uh, we don't teach our children all the ceremonial laws. We don't teach them all the political laws of the Old Testament. But we still teach the moral laws, because they are the sum total of the way life is best lived. And when you violate those laws, it's like trying to swim against a rip current. You will drown. You will be destroyed when you violate those attitudes. And if we do, and we, and we certainly all fall short, we need a course correction. We need to repent, swim with the tide, and then break free and be the ones that God has chosen us to be. Conformity is essential for human order, but our created uniqueness your uniqueness enables you to make a difference in things that matter to God, that matter to others, and will also change your own life. 
You know, these human interest stories that have accompanied the telling of the, of the stories of the Olympians, whether they be Michael Phelps' story, being born into a, a single mom's house. And, and when you think about the, the final five, these great athletes that, that tore up the women's gymnastic competitions, uh, Ali, Simone, Gabby, Laura, Lori and Madison, or Katie Ledecka, you, you think about their stories, they struggled. And through that struggle, God enabled them to become something very, very special. Now, while they have to compete and accomplish certain things with conformity to the rules, they also then have an opportunity to express their individual uniqueness. David was anointed. This is David's psalm. David was anointed the new king of Israel. God had had it with King Saul, who was the first king. Uh, king Saul began to believe his own uh, news clippings. He, he began to believe that he was something special when, in fact, God had made him special. But instead of giving glory to God, he took glory for himself. He began building statues to himself throughout the kingdom. He began ignoring Samuel's instructions about what he was to do. And so God rejected him as king. And he sent Samuel down to Bethlehem, to the house of Jesse, to choose a new king. Now, Jesse had a lot of sons. In fact, he had eight of them. And uh, Samuel comes down and he says, Jesse, bring your boys out. God has sent me to choose a new leader for the kingdom of Israel. Can you imagine how proud Jesse was? And he brought his oldest and his tallest, a captain in the Lord's army, you know, a mighty warrior, Eliab. And uh, Samuel said, and we're told this in 1 Corinthians 16, Samuel said, wow, I'm standing before the next king of Israel. And God whispered in his ear, not him. Man looks at the outward appearance. Man has their own values. Strong, tall, leadership ability. I have not chosen him. God looks at the heart. And so he had six other sons also pass by Samuel. And Samuel was not encouraged by the Lord to choose any of them. And Samuel looked at Jesse and said, what's up? And Jesse looked at Samuel and said, what's wrong with my boys? He said, do you have any other sons? as well there's the runt you know there's there's the kid he's out tending the sheep and samuel said have him fetched we will not sit down until he arrives i think it's a significant story and david was one of eight sons let's read that section of the scripture from first samuel 16. jesse had seven of his sons passed before samuel but samuel said to him the lord has not chosen any of these So he asked Jesse, are these all of your sons? He says, well, they're still the youngest. He's tending the sheep. Doesn't really matter. I didn't even think you'd want to look at him. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and he was brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance, handsome features. The Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. This is the one. Now, David's own father said, the boy is too young, he's too small, he's too inexperienced, he's too sensitive, he likes music for goodness sakes. What's the chance that anybody who plays and sings music could ever be a Christian leader? The band loves it when I say that. He's too unsophisticated, he's too unknown, and yet God said, David was the one. What are you two missing? What are you two missing? lacking, but you might be just the one. I have just a few questions uh, to finish my message with you today. Three questions to ask yourself. What are you uniquely gifted, positioned, and prompted to accomplish? I believe that if you really seek God's will for your life, it's right there. You just need to pray for a sensitivity to see it. And, And here's the mistake that we make. We often ask God to bless what we want to do instead of ask to know what he wants us to do. Instead of asking God to bless what we're doing, let's ask to do what God is blessing. You have an opportunity if you will embrace it. And I believe that if you pray about it and spend some quiet time, it will become apparent to you. Question number two. What person would be less loved, less encouraged, less supportive if you denied your purpose? You have relationships. Hundreds and even thousands of relationships represented in this room. If you're waiting to bring them to a preacher, waiting to bring them to a, 
a Christian leader or a conference or, or some book, you are that person. You have that relationship. It doesn't matter whether you change a thousand lives or whether you change one life. God cares for everybody equally. What person needs you to understand how great is God's love for them? What person is out there hurting that you could touch? I believe that if you pray about that and you spend some time considering that, there is that person that you know of that needs you. And then finally, this last question, what would you miss in life if you denied your uniqueness? What opportunity exists for you that if you pass on using your uniqueness would be lost to you? It's, it's the question of Esther. I, I call it the Esther equation or the Esther challenge. Esther, of course, was uh, chosen in a beauty contest to be the queen of all of Persia. Uh, and so she was a queen of a foreign king uh, who had set the people free from Babylon. And uh, she discovered a plot, or at least her uncle or her kinsman discovered a plot against the Jewish race. And they were going to destroy the Jews on a certain day. And Mordecai, her kinsman, said, Esther, you have to say something to the king. And Esther said, you don't understand, Mordecai. If I go to the king without him asking me to come, he could have me put to death. No one makes presumptions upon the king. And this is what Mordecai said to her. I know you risk your life to do this, but if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will come from somewhere else. God isn't going to let his people die. He's going to rescue them. So I would say that too to you, that, that somebody else's salvation, somebody else's uh, understanding of God's love isn't only on you. If you don't do it, God will see that it gets done. I pray through someone else. But here's the thing. Who knows if you have assumed your position for such a time as this. Esther, it will happen, but it won't happen through you, and you will be the lesser for it. I think that's also so true of us. We have this privilege. We have this opportunity. If we pass on it, you know, we are going to also be the lesser for it. So this week's challenge for you is this. Conduct a personal SWOT analysis. What are your strengths? I think that's pretty obvious. Each one of us are different. Each one of us have our strengths. Can you own them instead of being upset that you don't have somebody else's strength? Can you say the strengths I have are just fine and God can use them in a special way? What are your weaknesses? You say, well, I don't even want to pay attention to my weaknesses. I think you need to. Because your hurts, your pains, your sufferings, your losses open a door into somebody else's life who has suffered those things. And if somebody comes to them who hasn't identified or hasn't suffered or experienced the same kind of loss, the loss of a child, the loss of health, whatever the loss might be, whatever you might have hurt, whatever suffering you might endure, whatever temptation that is unique to you, whatever is your weakness, it gives you entree into other people, and there are thousands of them who have those weaknesses and who need you to speak to them. What are the opportunities that are presenting yourself, themselves to you right now? And what are the threats to you using your uniqueness? I'm talking about the threats of conformity. I'm talking about the threats of friends who say, no, no, you shouldn't do that when you know very well God wants you to do that. When success turns your head like it turns Saul, that can be a threat. You think you pray for success. Success may be the last thing God wants to give you because you can't handle it or the doubts that you may experience. Our days are numbered, the scripture says. He says, before there was even one of them, God knew the length of our days. The days for you are numbered before even one came to pass. Now is your privilege. Now is your opportunity. Now is your time. I pray that you will seize the moment and respect and appreciate that God created you fearfully and wonderfully to do something very unique and very special. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, help us not to despise who we are. Help us not to wish that we were somebody else. Help us not to uh, wish that we had different gifts than we have. Help us to realize like David that you created me. I'm a miracle. I'm one of a billion different possibilities you wove me in my mother's womb. You made me to be who I am. And that's a wonderful thing that you've made. Help me not to 
wish that I were something else, somewhere else, or had a different set of gifts. Lord, bless me to embrace my uniqueness, that I may make a difference in things that matter. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We've already sang some great songs, but we're going to sing one now that talks about um, how God makes beautiful things out of dust and out of us. I pray you're blessed by this.